let's talk about shape-shifting. Uh, one of my favorite topics. My name is John Moore and I am a shamanic practitioner and teacher from the state of Maine in the U.S. And let's get into shape-shifting. And if you are not a shamanic practitioner, if you are not somebody who practices shamanism, you might hear the phrase shape-shifting and you might think of werewolves and the like or you know other legends and that sort of thing um you know and that and that's totally fine but and you might think of shape-shifting as a fantasy thing that doesn't actually exist but i'm here to tell you that one commonality amongst shamanic cultures is the idea the idea of shape-shifting now i will say this never in my life have i witnessed someone's physical body transform into the physical body of another person or an animal or something along those lines although i would say there are some actors who can get pretty close to that um but so far everything i've witnessed in that realm anyway is well within the laws of physics and physiology as we know them i'm not going to say that it is impossible to physically transform into something else um, I don't like using the word impossible because we live in an infinite and expanding universe. And so statistically, anything is possible. I'm just saying I, it's improbable I haven't witnessed that aspect. But on a spiritual plane, shape-shifting is commonplace. So I want to talk a little bit about that. And um, one of the important aspects, one of the things to realize from this is how common stories of shape-shifting are. Um, one of a number of books that I'm reading on Celtic shamanism, um, and yes, I understand there are people, no shortage of people who want to tell me that there are people in Ireland who will say that Celtic shamanism didn't exist. Um, and I'll just say that I disagree with that 100%. Um, but I'm reading this as talking about the legend of Taliesin, who is, uh, who was actually from Britain, was probably Christian, but you know, definitely lived in that era where the Celts and the Christians and the Romans and you know all of those people were kind of intermixing. And uh, there are tales of you know a Celtic goddess and chasing him, or you know what becomes him chasing this young boy who accidentally imbibes her potion and they start shape-shifting. So he changes into a rabbit, she changes into a dog, he changes into some fish, a trout, she changes into a pike. She's chasing him, trying to kill him. <coughs> and finally, he transforms himself into a grain of wheat. She turns into a hen, eats the grain of wheat, but that impregnates her. Nine months later, she gives birth to this beautiful boy with a shining brow. Taliesin means shining brow. And so beautiful, can't bear to kill him. So she puts him in a leather bag and casts him into the ocean, which I suppose isn't attempting to kill him at all. And he's eventually found and becomes the legendary poet Taliesin. And those, Taliesin was, you know, a, a historical person that might not have been his actual name. We don't know. Um, and there, but with a lot of people in that time, King Arthur and Merlin and <clears throat> all of that stuff, um, there's a lot of myth, legend, and other things. But we have writings. We have writings attributed to Taliesin that scholars believe can be attributed to the same author. He became a bard. He served under kings legendarily under King Arthur, although the time frame doesn't particularly work out. Who knows? Who knows? But it's a tale of shape-shifting, okay? Uh, throughout Europe, we have uh, the swan shamanism, in which shamans turn into swans or other types of birds to carry the souls of the dead into the afterlife. In South America, in the North America, we have shapeshifters, skinwalkers, all kinds of um, shapeshifting is going on. Uh, <clears throat> in Africa, we have this. Okay, so this is a, a theme that runs across 
cultures, right? And there are there are lots of themes that that cross cultures, cultures that ha didn't have contact with each other over thousands and thousands of years, but still somehow have the same themes. So let's take dragons, for example. We might think of dragons in the East, you know, in, in Asia, the Chinese and Japanese dragons and Korean dragons. But there were dragons in Europe. King George slew the dragon, right? Dragons in the Americas, right? Um, Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, right? Was a, uh, is, is, was uh, an Aztec god. Um, feathered flying serpent sure sounds a lot like a dragon. So dragons are common. We have rock art with spirals on it everywhere. So tons of spirals in the Celtic world, tons of spi spirals in the American Southwest, in Africa, in Australia. So there are these themes that run through cultures that can all be tied to shamanic practice. Okay, in my opinion, shamanic practice might actually predate modern human biology, meaning there were uh, non-homo sapiens, there were, there were humans, hominids existing before homo sapiens that may have had some rudimentary shamanic practices. We know that Neanderthals buried their dead, which indicates a level of symbolic thought. There's a cave in called Kesem Cave in which they found a uh, wing bone of a swan that is 400,000 years old that appears to be haven't been used ceremonially so lots and lots of links that are common and these common links we they're they're so common that we often overlook them the thing that they have in common frequently is shamanic practice and if you don't know what to look for that can be challenging to see so shamans what shamans do is they alter their state of consciousness um some people call that an altered state of consciousness i'm going to refer to it as the ssc which is the shamanic state of consciousness because it is a very specific state it's different and we know this through um modern eeg research it's different than meditation it's different than being on magic mushrooms it's different than anything else but all human brains can do this. So shamanism is not limited to a single culture. And the shamanic impulse to awaken as the result of crisis is archetypal, meaning it is formless and exists in just humankind in general, right? It comes out of our collective unconscious, if you want to put a Jungian angle on it, okay? Shape shifting occurs in, you know, in almost every shamanic culture, maybe every shamanic culture. I'm not sure. Um, and we look, we look at cave paintings. So here's another common theme. We look at cave art um, everywhere from the American Southwest to Europe, tens of thousands of years ago to Australia, 50,000 years ago. Um, we see a couple of things. We see patterns um, which are you know specific geometric patterns that are experienced in certain altered states of consciousness but another common theme that we see are what are called therianthropes therianthrope means um half beast half animal or a com some combination of beast and animal where do we see this we see this in cave paintings thirty thousand years old in you know france and and uh spain we see it in ancient Egypt, right? I mean, all the, you know, the gods of ancient Egypt all had animal heads. And the Sphinx had the body of a lion and the head of a man. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So therianthropy, in some of these cave paintings, it looks like people are transforming into animals or are going from animal shape into person shape. We, there are images of that look like people becoming buffalo, for example. So this shape-shifting, or even this halfway state between human and animal is really common. And in shamanic cultures and shamanic stories, we see a lot of bird shamanism. 
swan shamanism, owl shamanism, and the birds being the psychopomps, the, the beings that are transporting souls into the afterlife. Okay. So in Western culture, we have angels, which we see as people with wings. But we have um, people in everywhere from Asia to the Americas wearing feathered coats in shamanic ceremony. It's important. It's important to recognize these commonalities, right? We see animal headdresses, animal prints, animal masks. We see this amongst lots of Native American tribes. We see this in Africa. Um, we see it in Europe. We have the oldest shamanic headdress um, ever recovered. Um, and it's hard to recover things that are organic because they decompose uh, rather quickly unless they're under really specific circumstances like in a desert or you know in a peat bog or something was a um a red deer a headdress made out of a red deer that was used in shamanic ceremony approximately eleven thousand years old and that was recovered in the uk so shamanic practice happened all over the world in lots of cultures that were separated over time by tens if not hundreds of thousands of years shamanism goes into antiquity the shamanic state is unique to human to human beings i mean we not unique but it, it's something that he, all humans have in, biologically inherited the ability to have their brain enter into a state for shamanic journeying um, and this is one of the main arguments i have when people come to me and say only people from whatever culture they decide to choose can practice shamanism. Only people from Siberia can practice shamanism because that's theirs and it doesn't belong to anybody else. Only people from, uh, you know, from Native American tribes can practice shamanism because it belongs to them. And here's the thing about that. Not every Native American tribe is shamanic. There are a hundred or so tribes that have been identified as having shamanic practices as part of their culture and shamanic practice is relatively universal but not completely so not that every single culture on earth practiced it but it was absolutely practiced in europe practiced in scandinavia we have practices of sev we have the oracles the delphic oracle who used um, hallucinogenic smoke to enter into a state of trance and um you know we have the uh, the Eleusian mysteries where tens of thousands of Greek people went to this temple and ingested psychedelic compounds, um, which was actually a beer brewed with um, uh, ergot infested uh, barley called kaikon. And they would hallucinate and they would experience becoming one with their gods. They would shapeshift into their gods and goddesses and experience the stories, and we don't fully know what happened there, um, because of course uh, that got stamped out with a lot of the a lot of you know the pag pagan world got stamped out when the uh, Roman Church came through um, and forced everyone to convert at the point of a sword and destroyed all the temples and built churches on them. And it's interesting because um, in the UK, in particular, but in other places in Europe. Um, they put churches on top of older holy sites, sites that were holy to people who had been there before. And so you can follow these ley lines, which are these energy lines, by following these lines of churches across uh, across the landscape. And I talked to somebody in the UK yesterday morning who was biking across some ley lines, visiting all of these spots um, with her husband. They had tents on the back of their bikes and they were... They were driving around. They must be getting electricity from somewhere because they talked to me via cell phone. But interesting stuff. Shape shifting. Let's get to this. So again, like I have not witnessed anybody physically changing their body into the body of an animal. Um, I can't say whether that's possible or not. It seems improbable to me. Um, but I don't automatically disbelieve everything just because it doesn't conform to my belief system either. 
I think that shows a really impoverished belief system where you just say anything outside of what I believe doesn't exist. Um, that's really limited and that is only necessary if you can't have some level of flexibility in your belief system. If you're so threatened by other things entering into your belief system that you can't possibly hold on to the idea of a, po a different possibility or a different reality. But shamans, when they enter into this shamanic state of consciousness, very frequently shapeshift in spiritual form. And the thing about spirit is, as we move away from the body, there are the, like layers of human spirit. There's the etheric double, which closely matches the human body. And it's the part that like acupuncture and Reiki work on, the energy healing part. So that part is a little bit amorphous, but still kind of close to the human body. As we move away, we get to the soul body. And this body has much less mass than the etheric body. And the physical body is very dense, mass-wise. Spirit technically doesn't have mass. You can't weigh it, right? And so as we move away from the physical, as we move away from matter and mass, um, space and time start to decompose because space and time are intimately linked with mass. You can check the equations. Ask Einstein. Um, that's just how it works. So these things are intimately linked. As we move away we become more formless. We take on form perhaps as an animal or we merge with a helping spirit, which could be an animal, could be a god or a goddess or an angel, what have you. And in which case there are some specific advanced shamanic practices in which you fully take on the energetic signature of that being. And that is my experience of shape-shifting and it is extremely powerful it's consciousness altering um it's like imagine changing your entire reality in a split second like everything the way you perceive everything the way you think about everything in a in a split second it's dramatic okay experientially it's dramatic it's a practice that um, that I do with some regularity. And the more you do this, the more flexible you become. Again, it, you're, you change your belief system, you change your spiritual makeup. Um, and it is a little bit, I, I talk about it a little bit like going to the gym and working on your muscles. Your muscles get bigger, they get more developed over time. And the same thing is true with shamanic practices and some other spiritual practices, that the longer you do them and the more you do them over time, you build your spiritual body, you build your spiritual abilities, your ability to change shape in the spirit world and to take on information that might be so foreign to you when you're starting out that it's difficult to ingest. So that's just a little bit about shape shifting. Um, I hope you found this really helpful. If you do practice shamanism, um, I'm going to post a link below this. Uh, I, along with a uh, partner who's a, a brilliant shamanic teacher, lots of experience in Celtic shamanism, um, have started a brand new online shamanic community. Um, if you do know how to journey and you practice shamanism, we would love to have you join us. Come check us out. I'm going to post a link below this. Um, it is... It's a fantastic community. We get together live, uh, you know, live online and do journeying together. And we have uh, social hours and we have all kinds of things to support people around the globe who are practicing shamanism in one form or another. And everyone, everyone who practices shamanism is welcome. So uh, give the link a click, subscribe to this channel, and I will talk to you real soon.